and exercise physiology seminar series. My name is Jaume Padilla and I'm a faculty member in the department of NEP. And today it's my privilege to introduce our speaker, Dr. Brian Bergman, who is a professor in the Department of Medicine and the Division of Endocrinology, Metabolism and Diabetes at the University of Colorado. He's also the director of the Molecular and Cellular Analysis Core at the Colorado Nutrition and Obesity Research Center. Um, Dr. Bergman is a true exercise physiologist by training. Uh, he obtained his bachelor's in exercise physiology at the University of Wyoming and also his master's and PhD in exercise physiology at the University of California in Berkeley, where uh, he overlapped with Dr. Potts. Subsequently, in 1999, he moved to University of Colorado for his postdoctoral fellowship. And four years later, he was uh, promoted to assistant professor, then associate professor, and then full professor. Uh, Dr. Berman is a very well accomplished investigator, uh, as noted by his publication record, as well as his uh, funding record. He's been continuously funded by NIH throughout his uh, academic career. And he currently holds uh, multiple R01s as well as grants from industry as a principal investigator. His research is primarily focused at understanding mechanisms of insulin resistance in uh, skeletal muscle. So by all standards, uh, Dr. Berman is an outstanding scientist, but as I learned last night during dinner, he's also an outstanding athlete. In 2016, he qualified for the Ironman World Championship in Kona, Hawaii. This is a very famous Ironman, uh, and it's the dream of any triathlete to qualify for this, for this sporting event. So on that note, uh, thanks, Brian, for accepting the invitation. Welcoming uh, Dr. Berman. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for the generous introduction. That's the longest introduction I've ever had. So that's like some kind of record. Uh, no, thanks for your time. It's been really fun being here. Thanks for the invitation to come. I'm, I'm honored to be one of the first people to, to come here post COVID. Your laptop, could you mute your laptop? I think we're getting everybody. Aha. Let's see here. Good. Is that good? Oh, that's so much better. Okay. Thank you. That was bugging me too. The whole hear you twice. Yeah. Nobody wants that. Once is enough. No, thanks for having me. It's really great to be here. Thanks for the invitation to come. And it's just been wonderful to, to meet everybody, see your awesome, awesome facilities, and, and meet everybody. It's great. Um, thanks for fixing that. I noticed that on the, uh, that there was a little thing up there. Anyway, okay. So um, I'm going to be talking today about something a little bit different. So intramuscular adipose tissue and how it's related to insulin sensitivity as well as muscle size and strength. And it's kind of the newest, greatest thing that I've been really pumped about in my lab. So briefly, what I do in my lab is not be able to control from the remote like I did a minute ago. I've lost control of my slides. Get, get, get out of your slides and then back into them. Yeah. Chris is, yeah. Chris, oh. there, there is, yeah. You guys are brilliant. OK, <laughs> thank you. OK, so the work that I do, and is there a way to get rid of that? It's just going to be there? Oh, that's better. Okay, sorry. We're getting this figured out. Okay, so the whole goal of my research is to develop novel therapeutic targets to treat or prevent type 2 diabetes. That's really the end all be all goal. And when I am thinking about targets for diabetes, it is all about skeletal muscle because skeletal muscle accounts for 80% of glucose disposal after a meal. It's by far the most important sink for glucose disposal. And right now, we've got no targets specifically developed against muscle or form muscle. We have weight loss and exercise, which work great if people are terrible at doing. Metformin has some off effects, but there's really nothing targeted. So my goal really that motivates me every day 
is to develop some target that really makes the muscle more sensitive to insulin. Like we could do huge inroads to preventing prediabetes and diabetes and the cardiovascular disease it brings. So I'm doing that two ways. One is by looking at bioactive lipid localization. That's one of the R1s in my lab. I'm not talking about that today, but we've made some inroads into looking at not only how much of the lipid is there in the muscle, that's where it's physically located. And the two really seem to be important in dictating how these bioactive lipids increase diabetes risk. What I'm talking to you today about is something extra or something different, which is intramuscular adipose tissue. So that's this adipose tissue that's laced between and within muscle fibers. So I have a steak up there and actually we have a steak picture outside of our lab because it's kind of what we do. Um, so when you look at a steak, all that marbling is intramuscular adipose tissue or IMAT. So IMAT makes your steak taste great, but it's not good for your health when it's in you. And we all have some at some level or another. So what I'm gonna tell you about is my story here with intramuscular adipose tissue. So a little bit of background. So I'm at is exactly that. It's adipose tissue between muscle fibers and under the fascia, but it's not intramuscular triglyceride. It's not fat stored within muscle, okay? It is adipose tissue and all the structure of adipose tissue outside of muscle cells. And I'll bring this up because <laughs> I wrote a grant once. I got done with it. I submitted it, got the reviews back. One of the reviewers thought I was talking about intramuscular lipid the entire time, which means I'm doing a bad job, but it also means that that needs to be kind of in the front and center. So here's an MRI of muscle. This is the femur. You can see the subcutaneous adipose tissue in red, and you can see the IMAT in yellow. So everybody has some of this stuff, and this is adipose tissue with all the blood vessels, all the extracellular matrix, the macrophages, the endothelial cells, fibroblasts, progenitor cells, like all the cells that are in adipose tissue or in the IMAT. So it's not just a fat cell. So we all, so why should we care? So this is work from Brett Goodpaster in 2001. And this is work showing insulin sensitivity on the y-axis done by insulin clamps. On the left-hand side, we have subcutaneous adipose tissue volume from these MRIs, or I think he did CTs. And you can see that there's no relationship. So more subcutaneous adipose tissue, no problem in terms of insulin sensitivity. And this is really data you know, because we know that subcutaneous adipose tissue is a healthy adipose tissue. It's a great place to store excess calories, right? But when you look at IMAT, there's this beautiful inverse relationship, which was significant, such that the people had more IMAT content in their thigh, had lower insulin sensitivity and vice versa. So this is really what put IMAT on the map in terms of its importance to diabetes risk. And this was just in 2001. So not that long ago. So this is why we care about it. So we know it's negatively related to insulin resistance. And the crazy thing is a lot of studies have followed. They've all been non-invasive studies. And they've shown that IMAT explains insulin resistance associated with age, sex, and ethnicity. It jives perfectly. And it really suggests that one might be influencing the other. And that's the story I'm, I'm gonna be telling. So we know that IMAT increases with age. And this is from the Health, Health ABC study of older individuals. And I think I could actually call them older because they're now older than me still. And that is becoming a smaller and smaller number of studies. But I think they were in their late 60s or early 70s. But what you can see here, this has changed from baseline, men on the left, women on the right. And you can see here is subcutaneous adipose tissue. And here it's intramuscular fat or intramuscular adipose tissue. What they had were three groups of people. They had people that lost weight were weight neutral or gained weight during this five-year follow-up. And what you can see is subcutaneous adipose tissue, whether you are a man or a woman, changed whether you gained or lost weight as you would expect. But look at the IMAT or the intramuscular fat as it's labeled here. No matter what you did, IMAT was increasing over time, which is kind of scary, right? So that means that weight loss alone is not gonna be able to prevent the accumulation of IMAT over time. So to not, have too much background here. So we know it's not intramuscular triglyceride or IMCL if you're in the non-invasive MRI world. Negatively related insulin sensitivity explains insulin resistance no matter who you are. One thing I'm not showing is that the cardiovascular disease risk is similar for visceral, ad visceral adipose tissue and IMAT. And it's kind of interesting, the visceral adipose tissue depot is roughly the same size as IMAT when you add it all together. And it looks like the cardiovascular risk is similar, which should scare you because IMAT has, well, nobody really knew the 
cardiovascular risk, but this are a tissue is well known to be negatively related to, to cardiovascular events. Looks like IMAT is very similar. And we know it increases with age. But what we don't know is whether these things are true, true, and unrelated, or if IMAT is actually causing any of these changes to occur. And this is really where the emphasis of my work has been going, is how IMAT could be inducing some of these changes in muscle insulin sensitivity. So the big questions I have is, does IMAT actually cause insulin resistance, or are they just increasing at the same time as insulin resistance is occurring? And if it is occurring, or if IMAT is causing insulin resistance, how is that occurring? And the way I think about it, this could be a huge clinically important question because of the sheer proximity. If you think about it, IMAT is right next to our muscle, or our muscles all over our body. If there are some kind of factors, maybe some signaling, some paracrine signaling that's coming out, that is impacting muscle insulin sensitivity, it could be having a huge impact that's been unknown to us until now. It also means that if we had some sort of intervention that could target the IMAT, change the signaling, it could be really potent and powerful for changing the muscle insulin sensitivity as well. I really do think that IMAT could be a novel therapeutic target. I think this has been an adipose tissue depot that's negatively impacting muscle forever. We've just never realized it. And it now opens up new, new ways in which we might be able to treat diabetes, I think. All right, so how to study IMAT? That's the big question. And this is why nobody's done the work. <laughs> it's really, really hard. So when you do a muscle biopsy, usually it's a Bergstrom biopsy, right? You just go in there and you, you take your biopsy. In our hands, we found that we were getting IMAT 45 to 50% of the time, which is not bad. We were saving it, it's all good. But if you're thinking about doing a targeted study, to study IMAT directly, that, that's going to cut it. You're going to have to study lots of people in order to get your same result going. So what we've done, this is what I was just mentioning, but we've we just developed an ultrasound-guided biopsy approach. So these chicken legs are mine, and this is my team practicing how to do ultrasound-guided biopsies on my legs. So the way this works is using the ultrasound, and this is a linear transition probe, you can see the needle going into my leg at this point, and we're targeting these white bits. So the linear stuff is fascial planes. You don't want this. What you want are these blobs. The blobs are the IMAP. So you can see, despite my athletic accomplishments, which I <laughs> kind of self-conscious about, uh, but I still have subcutaneous adipose tissue here, here in white, but you can see there's also white interspersed within in your leg. So that's what we're trying to target. And what we found is that the operator here is doing both these things that can triangulate the IMAT and then actually go after it with a needle. The way these needles, these are monopty needles, they use them in the OR, they fire about a centimeter and a half. So what we do is we uh, visualize the blob that we wanna go after, we stop the needle about a centimeter and a half beforehand and then fire it, pull it out, and you, uh, you un uncock the needle, it reveals the sample. And we actually are finding that we're getting IMAT now 90% of the time. So it's crazy successful compared to just going in blind. And actually, Melanie Cree Green, who works a lot with Elizabeth, she's the, the physician on all my protocols. She's getting pretty good at using a Bergstrom biopsy as well. She can like, I don't know, use one of those water finder things. And she's like, oh yeah, it's right here, I can feel it. <laughs> and she finds that when she goes a little bit more superficially, she tends to be more IMAT. And in my world, I only call it IMAT if I am physically piecing apart adipose tissue from muscle. If you just get, Fat, you can't call it IMAT because usually it was subcutaneous adipose tissue or that kind of a thing. So by visualizing it, we're able to know that yes, we penetrated the fascia and yes, it's gonna be IMAT. But this is hard, this is difficult to do. And if you look at this needle, that's pretty small relative to a Bergstrom, right? So if you fill that bore with 100% muscle, we're getting around 30 milligrams of tissue. So it's pretty small. So we do three to maybe four passes to get the tissue that we need. The other problem is we deal with really, really small samples. So to give you a feeling for it, I get excited and my lab makes fun of me when I have two milligrams of IMAP, two milligrams. So think about muscle, right? A, a, a grain of rice is about 10 milligrams. So think about like a third of a grain of rice. That is sometimes what we're dealing with where we're dealing with IMAP. Biopsies. A really big one might be 20 milligrams. And sometimes when the ones you get with a Bergstrom biopsy are quite low. So small samples, and you're really hamstrung in terms of what you can do with it. 
we bumbled our way through a lot of different mistakes, figuring out what we can do with these samples. And we finally stumbled on making conditioned media. So my simplistic thought was, if I'm at is impacting muscle, maybe it's doing it through local signaling. That means paracrine factors. So if we measure that, maybe we'll have a, a chance to find out what's going on. So what we are doing is we are now generating conditioned media. So bedside, we're looking at the IMAT under a dissecting scope. In the operating rooms, which I'm going to show you later, we have these looking at them in the lights in the corner. And we are, oh my goodness. Okay. Uh, so we're actually pulling these out of biopsies. The NIH, when I first pitched this to them, said, okay, if you say this is bad, show us the money, right? They wanted us to compare this adipose tissue to well-known, well-categorized adipose tissues. So we started collaborating with our bariatric surgeons, and we started collecting subcutaneous and visceral adipose tissue, healthy and unhealthy adipose tissues against which we could compare IMAP. So after a lot of ups and downs, and my PhD students actually pushing me to do better science, we figured out the best way to make these secret tomas. And there's all kinds of ways in the literature to do this. And so if you want any of this data, just let me know. I'll share it with you so you don't have to do these experiments. But what we're doing is we come back to the lab. We cut up the muscle into 10 to 20 milligram. Oh, sorry, not the muscle. That's my head. It's my adipose tissue. We cut up the adipose tissue into 10 to 20 milligram uh, amounts. We filter it. And this is over a Falcon tube with like 50 cc's of DMEM, just a media to kind of get rid of any of the, the result of that damage, weigh it. We then culture it in a 20 to one volume. So if you have that two milligrams of IMAT, that means you're gonna have 40 microliters of condition media. And that's all the great condition media we can do for it. We culture it for 24 hours, and then we can sample it and save it. This allows us to not only look at what is secreted in IMAT compared to these other adipose tissue depots like subcutaneous and visceral adipose tissue, but it also allows us to compare the IMAT secret tome in obese people compared to lean or people with diabetes compared to not. Like it allows a lot of interesting uh, comparisons to be made. It also allows us to take that secret tome and apply it to things like muscle cells and culture to see if it causes problems. So I could take you through this, but my lab, they did serial sampling so that we had a bariatric surgery samples. They brought them in the lab and they effectively slept in the lab for two days. So every four hours, they were sampling the secret home to figure out what's the sweet spot. Where can you actually get stable secretion rates without getting cytotoxicity or hypoxia, that kind of a thing. And the moral of the story is you, you uh, condition it. You throw out the first hour, one hour, because that's a lot of damage being released and whatnot. You can then sample it for 23 hours where things are nice and stable. After that, you start to get a tick up in light toxicity. So we sample for 24 hours. And I'll share all that data. So what we wanted to do is first just compare, OK, how bad is IMAT compared to these other adipose tissue depots? So we had IMAT from seven individuals that we just happened to save and be able to do this condition media from, from my current studies. And we compared subcutaneous and visceral adipose tissue from people undergoing bariatric surgeries. Not the best comparison, because there are two different groups, but this is all we had at the time. We matched them for age, BMI, as you would expect, which be, was much higher in people who are going through bariatric surgery. Other than that, A1C and fasting glucose was the same. Well, I want to point out that this is probably the least powerful comparison for IMAT, because these are leaner individuals, not as obese. So if anything, this is going to place IMAT at a disadvantage when you compare it to visceral adipose tissue. You like more foreshadowing? It's, it's good, right? Okay, so the big question was, <clears throat> does IMAT promote insulin resistance. So we decided to do this in a cell culture model where we have primary muscle cell cultures and we look at insulin stimulated glycogen storage. So this is a C14 glucose that's stored in the glycogen. It's really the best way to measure insulin sensitivity in muscle cells. We had a control condition where everything's normalized too, where we just put in you know, DMAM, a media. We also had condition media from subcutaneous adipose tissue, which really didn't do anything. Since then, we've seen it sometimes fall a little bit with subcutaneous adipose tissue, but not a whole lot going on. So not surprisingly, visceral adipose tissue, when you apply that condition media, and I'm talking about 10% of the total volume, it's a low dose. It's not like it's 100%, it's small. When you put that in, in the, uh, the media, you had a dramatic decrease, a 60% decrease in insulin sensitivity, just from all the gunk that is being secreted from visceral adipose tissue. 
but the money question was IMAT. It ends up IMAT was almost identically effective or negative towards insulin sensitivity as visceral adipose tissue. So the implications of this were kind of crazy. This effectively means that we have the equivalent of visceral adipose tissue next to our muscle all the time, bathing it with factors that is promoting decreased insulin sensitivity, which I don't know, scares me and it might scare you. So then we wanted to know how and why. And so I run a lipidomics lab. So we said, let's look at lipids because that's what you do, right? And we know that these are very lipidly like active tissues. The thought that it could be promoting fatty acid uptake and bioactive lipids is not super surprising. And what we found was, um, this is 1,2-DAG. So this is the isomer of DAG that's known to bind to PKC and induce insulin resistance. So we found that with uh, control and subcutaneous adipose tissue, no change in, in DAG accumulation, but it increased a lot with visceral adipose tissue, as you might expect. Similar thing happened with IMAT. So IMAT looks like it's causing fatty acid uptake and DAG accumulation. We looked at everything else too that everybody's thinking about and nothing was different. Is this a muscle cell line or primary or? These are primary. primary so muscle. primary muscle cell cultures, yeah. And usually these are for lean donors. Wow. Yeah. So no change in single lipids, none of that stuff, just, just DAGs. We then looked at like lipolysis rates because it's well known that visceral adipose tissue is more lipolytically active compared to subcutaneous. And sure enough, IMAT also has a high lipolytic rate. Probably not surprising considering the data it shows you. It looks like it's driving fatty acid release and therefore uptake into the cells, DAG accumulation, insulin resistance. So we have this cartoon that my uh, made, and this was actually published. You can't see it. This is SACS H or S A C H S in 2019 for AJP. And so we now know this is supposed to be IMAT, and this is skeletal muscle that IMAT is releasing FFAs increasing bioactive lipid formation, and that is one mechanism by which IMAT can be decreasing insulin sensitivity. We then also had all of this IMAT that we had dissected out of muscle, and that's really where my first idea of using IMAT came from. In my other studies, as I was mentioning, we're looking at bioactive lipids. There's so much more lipid outside of muscle compared to in, that when you take a muscle biopsy, you've got to put it on a dissecting scope and get rid of all that extra muscular fat before you measure the muscle. Me being a bit of a stingy guy, I've been saving all of that IMAT and freezing it, right? Everybody else trashes it. <laughs> so I've been freezing it, but it allowed us to do this really cool study. It allows us to do RNA seq on that IMAT that we dissected out of the muscle. So we knew it was IMAT in these four groups. And these are kind of the four groups that I love to work with because they span the physiological range of insulin sensitivity. We have endurance trained athletes, lean controls, individuals with obesity and people with type 2 diabetes who were also obese. Our sample sizes were kind of small because these are just the random samples that we were able to get that were at this point 20, 20 to 25 milligrams because we had a huge muscle biopsy from which we were dissecting all this IMAT. And as you can see, these people are super young. Uh, and I, I can say that now because I'm an old man. And as you expect, the, the BMIs were low in, in these two groups, athletes and elite controls higher in people with obesity and type 2 diabetes, body fat changes you would expect. And what's really cool is our glucose, glucose infusion rate during our insulin clamps. Every group is significantly different from the next one. And this is the beauty of this model of this cross-sectional study that we went from 2.3 for the make per kg per minute glucose infusion rate up to 12.2. So just a vast range in insulin sensitivity. Okay, so first, the thing, first thing we did is we took muscle and we did RNA-seq. We also did IMAT. And from an older study, we had subcutaneous adipose tissue biopsies. So we sent them off to Munich. This is Susanna Hoffman's lab did this for us. And they ran RNA-seq. And this is a multidimensional scaling plot, kind of like a PCA plot, just kind of putting everything together and seeing where it all, where it all sticks. And you can see that IMAT is really quite different in terms of its overall mRNA expression compared to skeletal muscle and subcutaneous adipose tissue. This was to convince reviewers that we're not just studying subcutaneous adipose tissue, right? What's also kind of cool for people doing sex difference research, look at this V. And if you squint and you believe me, you can kind of see a V here too. It ends up that all these subjects on the left are women, and the ones on the right are men. Same here and same here. So there's a tremendous sex-based difference in the gene expression of not only subcutaneous adipose tissue, but also an IMAT. I haven't explored it, but I'd love to. So we're actually looking at IMAT. It's not just subcutaneous adipose tissue. 
So one of the questions we wanted to ask is, does IMAP promote inflammation, right? It's sort of the low hanging fruit in terms of how this might be working. And here are four groups, athletes, lean folks, individuals with obesity and type 2 diabetes. And I just want to focus your attention on PI1. These are cytokine gene expression, the same relationship held true when you looked at macrophage markers. And what you can see is there's a significant relationship between the expression of PI1 and in this case, insulin sensitivity from a clamp. And that was the true whether you looked at multiple different cytokines or also macrophage expression markers. What that means is IMAT seems to be worse with packed with more macrophages, with the ability to secrete more cytokines and people who are more um, metabolically compromised or people with type 2 diabetes and obesity. That means that IMAT is not just IMAT. This is how I'm interpreting it at least. It seems like IMAT gets worse as people go down this road to less metabolic health. So that was the gene expression story, but we had all the secretome data and it allowed us to actually measure the secretion of these cytokines. So here are three groups, subcutaneous and white, the visceral adipose tissue in gray and the IMAT in the dark, which I'm not showing yet. And this is cytokine production rate or secretion rate from these tissues over a 24 hour period, okay? This is not super surprising data. We know that visceral adipose tissue is bad. This, this data, by the way, on the secretome is not nearly as deep as you think. There's like four or five studies that have really classified the secretome of visceral adipose tissue as bad. And as you can see, interferon gamma, uh, IL-13, TNF-alpha, that's a T, sorry, uh, higher in visceral adipose tissue. But the question was, what about IMAT? Ends up that IMAT has a very similar cytokine secretion profile as visceral adipose tissue, no matter what you looked at. And you could maybe wave your hands around and say it's worth some in some places. But in general, IMAT and visceral adipose tissue seem to have a very similar cytokine secretion profile. These are low abundance cytokines. We also had the high abundance cytokines and really the same story was there. This is IL-6 and IL-8 on the right-hand side. Sorry for it being covered up. So it looks like that or visceral adipose tissue and IMAT kind of similar in terms of their negative ability to uh, have pro-inflammatory factors that are secreted. We also looked at icosanoids. Icosanoids are funny lipids people don't think about much, but they're pro-inflammatory. We have a history of being able to measure this in our lab. Things like thromboxane, prostaglandin E2, these heats. These heats are lipoxygenase acting on arachidonic acid to make these molecules, which are also potent signaling molecules. There's a bunch of them. And there's really not a whole lot going on here, but with IMAT, IMAT is secreting a ton of these inflammatory lipids. Lipids that have been shown to promote apoptosis, dysfunction in cells. So these are yet another way by which IMAT, in a paracrine way, can be acting impacting muscle metabolism. We also then uh, looked at inflammation, and this is just a small n, mostly for preliminary data for a grant. But what you can see is when we put the uh, subcutaneous visceral and IMAT condition media on primary muscle cells again, there was sort of a, a dose-dependent increase in a way. Uh, you can just pretty much say that visceral adipose tissue and IMAT both cause increased junk phosphorylation and a response to inflammation as you would expect in these primary cell cultures. So not only is it pro-inflammatory, there's inflammatory response when the secretome hits the muscle. So now we can add to our cartoon and show that icosanoids are also secreted as well as inflammatory cytokines that also can contribute to decreased insulin sensitivity. So then we started thinking about fibrosis. So there's all this cool data showing that the exercise of the matrix and, and fibrosis in general can impact muscle insulin sensitivity. So we wanted to look at that. <clears throat> we then did this through proteomics. We looked at protein secretion rates. And here's a few I pulled out, fibrinogen, beta, different collagens, fibronectin, TGF beta one. Not a whole lot going on, but as you might expect, there was a lot of this secreted from IMAT. So it looks like IMAT is secreting these extracellular matrix factors that have been known to be related to decreased insulin sensitivity. And so that change in the extracellular matrix really could impact tissue insulin sensitivity as well. Collagen, six alpha three. I don't know if this rings any bells in, any, in this room, but have you guys heard about Phil, Scherer, Phil Scherer's mouse where he knocked out a collagen and the mice were able to expand their adipose tissue depot and they were huge, but they were metabolically helpful, healthy. It was collagen six alpha three that they knocked out. So it's kind of interesting that this is the one that also seems to be secreted higher in IMAT. So kind of a curious sort of thing. All right, so now we can also include protein secretion here 
and um, exercise matrix in terms of ways in which IMAT might be able to decrease insulin sensitivity. Okay, so it's sort of changing focus a little bit. I've been talking about insulin sensitivity and I wanna talk about muscle strength, kind of the sarcopenia story. Because we also know that IMAT is tightly related to the loss of muscle mass and strength, especially as we age. I was at an NIH symposia talking about myosteatosis and somebody showed a slide of like the typical garden variety person you study in school from 20 years old and then all the way through life until they were 80. The overall cross section of muscle really never changed much, but the amount of fat that was marbled in there changed dramatically. And it went from mostly muscle to at the end, almost mostly fat. And so I'm at really accumulates in people as they age. And we know it's inversely related to muscle strength. So here's studies again from Brett Goodpasper at the TRI in Florida. And they're looking at this effect. So this is mid thigh attenuation. It's a really kind of funny term from CTs to look at overall amount of fat in muscle. So it's a measurement of myosteatosis. Low attenuation means more fat. And that's why it's kind of hard to think about. So as BMI increases from left to right on the x-axis, attenuation goes down whether you're a man or a woman. And that's associated with more lipid accumulation. This is going to be both IMAT as well as fat that's stored within muscle. What they also found was that muscle attenuation, now on the x-axis on the right-hand side, was related to specific torque. And so specific torque is the amount of force that's produced normalized for cross-sectional area. So we're all taught in X-Phys that force is proportional to cross-sectional area, right? What this says is that's not necessarily true. Because as people went from the right side here to the left side, meaning from less fat to more fat, torque production decreased, normalized for cross-sectional area. So this is giving you this idea of muscle quality. So it looks like IMAT and myosteatosis in the limb is related to decreased force production, decreased strength, decreased muscle quality. Here's another inverse relationship. This is power or work on the x-axis and IMAT volume on the y-axis. This is just a little easier to wrap your head around. Inverse relationship instead of dealing with the mid thigh attenuation. So more IMAT seems to be related to less strength. And it's also been related to decreased muscle mass as well. So we started thinking about this. And it's actually written in my grant. I haven't done too much until recently. So I'm starting to get more excited about it. So the lowest hanging fruit I can think about was myostatin. Right? So myostatin, most people are shaking their heads, which is good. It's a myokine. It's called a myokine, but it's actually secreted by subcutaneous adipose tissue, visceral adipose tissue, lymphocytes. There's a lot of different cell types that actually secrete myostatin. But it binds to these activin-2 receptors and promotes loss of muscle mass. So NASA is over the moon about myostatin. And we've been involved with some studies where they're trying to figure out how they can block myostatin activation, which could prevent the atrophy that occurs in space flight. Because these astronauts come down and they've atrophied dramatically. So NASA's really excited about this work. Here's some work in vitro. This is from Brett and Lauren down to the, or Lauren Sparks and Brett Goodspaster down to the TRI. These are primary muscle cells in culture in a control situation. And then they gave them more and more myostatin. And what you can see is the, the values on the right-hand side. There's a decrease in myotube diameter. This is an in vitro estimation of kind of sarcopenia, if you want to talk about that, or muscle size. I know it's not perfect but myotube diameter decreases as myostatin goes up. So we know that myostatin can decrease muscle mass. What really got me pumped about myostatin was this paper. You guys know the Hensfeld paper? So this is with this molecule that I always mispronounce, but I'm gonna try it, bimagromab. Bim bimagromab, yeah, that's hard. Anyway, so this is an antibody that blocks activin-2 receptors. So it's an activin-2 receptor antagonist. So this has been developed because in rodent studies, they found that if they block the activin-2 receptors, they blocked myostatin action, these rodents became lean and they preserved their muscle mass. They were more insulin sensitive. It looked like a miracle. So this is a paper that just published this year in JAMA and they found some remarkable stuff. So these are people with type two diabetes that were in a control situation here. So the placebo or they were given bimagromab. It was once every four weeks, they were blocking this activin-2 receptors. They were both told to go through 500 calorie per day deficit and lose weight and be more active, kind of the same stuff that all patients are really suggested to do. 
And you can see that nimogramab caused a huge decrease in total body fat mass, which went about 35 kilos down to like 28 kilos of fat mass. No change in the placebos. But what was really unique about this, like great prize is a weight loss study, awesome. But what they found was lean mass increased. And so I don't know of any scenario in which you're losing weight and you're gaining lean mass. Most of the time, you're always losing lean mass. Exercise helps spare some of that lean mass, but you're still losing it. This actually is like the super drug, right? You're losing fat mass and gaining lean mass. These people also had a, a decrease in hemoglobin A1C, suggesting that their glucose control was better as well. So I saw this, I started getting really pumped. And it made me wonder, could myostatin and these active and two receptor agonists be related to how IMAT is related to muscle mass and muscle strength? So this is what we found. The answer is yes. So this is the secretion rate of these activin-2 receptor agonists. GDF8 is another name for myostatin, okay? And these other GDFs and BMP6. But when you compare IMAT to subcutaneous and visceral adipose tissue, it was nearly double the rate of secretion. This is also kind of scary because that means we're not only does IMAT secrete factors that are decreasing insulin sensitivity, but it's also weak in the muscle in myostatin that is then going to be able to decrease muscle mass. So this is true of the other active and two receptor agonists. We also wanted to look at whether it changed, whether you were old versus young. This is a small sample size I did for our grant submissions. This is an NF5 in the old group and NF5 in the young group with a p-value of 0.8 with those kind of small sizes. It's, it's pretty compelling that there may be an increase in myostatin secretion with people as they get older. So this suggests to me that sure enough, I'm at could be secreting myostatin and other factors that are directly impacting muscle mass and muscle strength, which nobody's really, nobody knows about right now. It has a huge, huge impact for sarcopenia. So there's a lot of gaps in the literature though. Some of the common questions I get is what's the ideology of IMAT? Why is it there to begin with? And why does it increase with age? And it's interesting, cardiologists talk about epicardial and pericardial adipose tissue. And think about this, epicardial adipose tissue, that acronym is EAT. It's a terrible one, right? So cardiologists think about epicardial adipose tissue as a buffer, as a protective thing. And because there's no membrane between epicardial adipose tissue and, and the heart. So they think it's a buffer to fatty acid load to the myocytes. So it's possible that IMAT is protective. Maybe there's a, a scenario in which it's good. Lauren Sparks has data in overweight women suggesting that IMAT might not be so bad. So she and I, have like lively debates about this. But why is it there and why does it increase with age? Nobody knows. People think it might be fibroadipogenic precursors that they get pulled into adipocytes. Could it be a satellite cell that gets transformed into an adipocyte lineage? Hyperglycemia has been shown to do this. Nobody really knows. And is all IMAC created equal? Like Mike Jensen has great work showing that adipose tissue distribution has a huge impact on this related to cardiovascular disease. What about IMAC? Is I'm at in your arm or your torso or your leg? Is it all the same? These are questions we don't know right now. My answer, my gut feeling is that they're not all the same because no adipose tissue seems to be when you look at it. Another question is how does the IMAT respond to lifestyle and pharmacological interventions? We don't know. I'm gonna show you some data that suggests that it does, but right now there's nothing published. And then most importantly, really in my world is how does IMAT decrease insulin sensitivity? Because if we could figure that out, I think we really go down a road towards developing a therapeutic intervention, which would be really powerful. And then also, how does IMAT impact muscle mass and strength? So to this question, does IMAT respond to lifestyle and pharmacologic interventions? We have some preliminary data. Most of this data actually is preliminary. It's not been published, so I'm, I'm sharing with you. So we just finished a study where we had groups of people who were obese with or without prediabetes that went through either a weight loss arm this is covered up. This middle arm is an exercise training only with no weight loss. And the right-hand side is a control arm. They just lived their lives and came back and we retested them. This is an IMAT change from an MRI where we segmented the leg and looked at the IMAT volume. And much to my dismay, exercise really didn't do much in terms of changing IMAT content, right? It's a cure-all except for IMAT. With weight loss, it actually has a dramatic decrease in IMAT content. So it looks like weight loss is pretty powerful at decreasing the content. But what we don't know is, is whether or not it would decrease the secretome and some of these other factors. Yeah. So this exercise group, they weren't losing weight. They were just exercising. Correct. Ensure, like, so are we ensuring that they weren't losing weight while they were exercising? 
Yeah, so we actually study these people and we weigh them every week and we had a dietist or a dietitian. Sorry, dietist, that's terrible. What's that? You have them on like some sort of maintenance diet that would come back over the years. Of yeah, and if they started to lose weight, which very few people did, we would say, you know, increase your energy intake a bit. Yeah, so this is supervised. The volume of IMAT did not change with exercise, but the phenotype of IMAT changed with exercise. That's an awesome question. So for people that are on Zoom, the question is, sorry, I didn't repeat it before. Uh, did the, what was it, the, the, the phenotype of the IMAT change with the intervention? Yeah. We don't know. We're looking at that now, uh, but we don't know. Okay, uh, so IMAT not so great in terms of responding to exercise, but we also have other good data showing that as people age, exercise actually does really a good job of preventing the accumulation of IMAT. So. Here is the answer to your questions. This is a different study that we finished up. This is combined weight loss and exercise training. And these are people, the unicorns, from which we got IMAT before training and after training. And given the 50% chance, there's not very many of them. This is like an N of four or five, so it's very preliminary. But what it shows <clears throat> is that these are paired analysis. So the individuals before training in this open histogram, after training in the closed histogram, and this is protein secretion rates of the IMAT that we measure using this, okay? So matrix of metalloproteases go up dramatically after training, suggesting it might be remodeling the extracellular matrix, right? Which seems to be very important for diabetes risk. Here's a few other ones. This is kind of alphabet soup down here, but AREG, this is a alpha regulin, limits adipose tissue mass. So how interesting that it went up after training, like it's starting to limit the growth of the IMAT itself. And NFAT C3 activates adipose tissue macrophages, it went down after endurance training or this combined weight loss exercise training. The point I'm trying to make is that the secretome of IMAT seems to be malleable and it seems to change with lifestyle interventions. And that's both good and bad, right? That means that as people go down the road to metabolic disease, their IMAT secretome is probably getting worse, but it also means that we can intervene and hopefully make it better. We also looked at these activin-2 receptor agonists, myostatin here, GDF8. And this is also small. This sample size is still on the kind of the end of four or five. So p-values of 0.12 are somewhat meaningful when you're talking about that low of a sample size. But BMP6 actually legitimately decreased and myostatin, this GDF8, looked like it was starting to go down after endurance training and weight loss. So again, showing that IMAT is malleable and it looks like some of these lifestyle interventions that we think about can have positive effects on the IMAT secretome. Okay, but the secretome, when you think about that, we know it's gonna be dictated by the cells that are in the tissue, right? And there's actually amazing data by John Fain from Tennessee. He's shown that when you think about adipose tissue secretions, whatever it is, 90%, 9-0 of what is secreted is not coming from adipocytes. It's coming from all of the other cells that are in adipose tissue, the stromal vascular fraction as people think about it. So the vast majority of stuff that's coming out of IMAT too is not gonna be dictated by the adipose tissue, but by all the other cells that are in there. So this is a question I got for years. What's the cell type? How do you know? What's in there? What's secreting it? And we never knew. Because when you get a two to four milligram piece of tissue, what are you, what are you gonna do with that, right? So what we decided to do, this was actually for a motorback ancillary study, from the study in which we had combined weight loss and exercise training, where we're dissecting out the IMAT, we pooled the, these samples. So we, from our pooled samples had about 100 milligrams of IMAT before training and 100 milligrams after training. We sent it to Marty, Sha or Marty Walsh at Sinai and he did single nuclei RNA-seq on them, okay? Super cool stuff to look at the cell composition. And this was hard because there is no map for the cells that are in IMAT. So they, they had to kind of figure it out and it's really difficult. So here's the cell types that they found in IMAT. First off, let's just talk about the white elephant in the room. Adipocytes, super small amount of cells. So we, we like I did any of this, uh, this is Lawrence Sparks group at the TRI in Florida. They did a centrifugation step through sucrose to kind of clean up the cells. And we think we lost a bunch of our adipocytes. So we're gonna clean this up with subsequent analysis. So we didn't have as many adipocytes as we thought. There's also a little bit of skeletal muscle contamination. I have a hard time accepting that because I physically was the one dissecting the sample. And I know there wasn't, wasn't this much contamination. So 
when I see this and other RNA-seq analysis that we've done also shows all this contamination, I personally think there's a lot of transdifferentiation, transdifferentiation of muscle cells or muscle satellite cells that retain a signature of a myocyte and they become an adipocyte. And so that's what I think part of that is. Because I know I, I'm not perfect, but I'm not that bad. Okay, so here's our dot plot showing adipocytes and skeletal muscle. We also have uh, fibroadipogenic precursors, these FAPs that people think generate IMAT. Also have progenitor cells. And look at all these immune cells, a lot of immune cell populations. I'm not showing it here, but there was another analysis that we did, quite a lot of different immune cells. As you would expect, right? We know that adipose tissue has a lot of immune cells. So let's look at IMAT and these pooled samples. These are like eight or nine people. So it's, it's an N of one, but it's kind of an N of eight or nine if you think about it that way. I do not know what the three and the zero are. Yeah, we. this was a huge push to get this. The FAPs are the zero. The FAPs are oh, sorry, yeah. FAPs are zero. I don't know what three is. I don't know what four is. Yeah, and these are. this is really difficult to do in terms of figuring out what the cell types are, um, but I, I won't bore you with that. Let's just look at the pre-intervention uh, sample, this pooled sample. As you can see, Again, we don't have a lot of adipocytes because we lost them in the prep, clearly. A little bit of skeletal muscle, so or eight and seven. But there's a huge amount of, of immune cells, one, five, and six, a lot of them in there, okay? Look at post-intervention. So after they lost weight and exercise trained, we really got rid of a dramatic amount of the immune cell population in the IMAC, which is not surprising considering some of the secretome differences that we've seen, and that is malleable. But this suggests that the amount of negative inflammatory cytokines that are coming out of IMAT is also going to be quite different after an intervention like this. What was also weird is we had accumulation of FAPs and accumulation of progenitor cells. And what that means, I don't know. Nor do we know, again, what three is and, and what it's doing there and why it increased. But either way, what this shows is that the cell composition of IMAT is malleable after you go through a lifestyle program, a lifestyle uh, exercise. And weight loss training program. So the other thing that we're really curious about are these two questions. How does IMAT decrease insulin sensitivity? And does IMAT impact muscle mass and strength? We have an active study going on right now where we're in the operating rooms and you know you're a tourist in the operating room when you're taking pictures of each other. So that's definitely us. But this is Melanie Cree Green on the left, one of my, uh, my main collaborators and Darcy Khan, my PhD student. They've become scrub certified, Melanie already was, but my lab loves this because walking in the OR and you're all scrubbed up, you're like, oh yeah, I'm ready to go, you know? And everybody feels really excited. And it's a really fun environment to be in. I feel like a fish out of water, just hoping somebody doesn't yell at me. But uh, we're working with our surgeons now to have access to patients that are going through either bariatric surgery or elective operations that have laparoscopic access. Things like hiatal hernias, anti-reflux, these kind of things. So these are non-inflammatory conditions that People are going in, they're getting laparoscopic access. So for this study, we're creating 84 men and women, huge range of BMI, especially because we're getting people from bariatric surgery. They span the range of insulin sensitivity. We work them up before the surgery. And then during the surgery, we take a lot of cool samples. So first we take a vastus lateralis IMAT sample. This is fun, uh, fun in like quotation marks because the patient goes down with anesthesia and my team runs in like a Formula One pit crew. And we have like four minutes. So we already have our stator field ready to go. The physician gets in there and he starts, or he or she starts looking at and triangulating the IMAT and taking the sample. We have another person ready to uncock the needle and hand off the muscle to somebody else who's then dissecting it, put it in DMAM or freezing it and getting it ready to go. So this happens, we do three or four passes and we step back and we let the, let the surgery happen. Because we don't want to get into the surgeon's way that's generally a road to stopping a research project. So that's one of the samples we get. We also, from the laparoscopic sites, get transverse abdominis skeletal muscle. There's two reasons for this. One, I don't wanna do the vastus lateralis biopsy, and so I'm trying to figure out if this would work, but it's also gonna help us answer the question of distribution of IMAT. Is all IMAT the same? And we're gonna be able to figure out if that is different. We're also getting subcutaneous adipose tissue, again, from laparoscopic access. Visceral adipose tissue, and we're grabbing momentum. And while we're in there, might as well grab some liver too. 
And so I'm really interested in looking at how the visceral adipose tissue secretome might be impacting fatty liver. And this is one of the ways we're doing this. Um, yeah, so this is going to be cool because it's allowing us to compare visceral and subcutaneous adipose tissue to IMAT in two locations in the same individual, which is going to help make the science a little bit better than what we were doing before, where they were from different people. So it'll be a little bit more. So I'm at how bad can it be? The secretome really suggests it's similar or worse than visceral adipose tissue, depending on what you're thinking about. Inflammatory cytokines, FFAs, exercise metrics and fibrosis, insulin resistance, and also local myostatin delivery. And what really makes me excited about this as a possible therapeutic target is that the IMAT secretome, it's always bathing the muscle and it's always influencing metabolism. And I don't think we've really noticed it before because once these local factors get out into the blood, they just get diluted. And you don't know that they have this high local concentration next to muscle. And importantly, the IMAT secretome appears to be malleable. And what I don't know yet is how the secretome difference is, differs in lean versus obese, diabetes versus not. These are things that my study that's going on is helping to address. So thanks for your time. I have an awesome research team. This is Melody Cree Green. Amanda Simona, she is my lab manager. Chris Johnson and Corinne work in the lipidomics cores. This is Darcy Kahn, my PhD student. This is Emily Macias. This is a going away for party for her. She just went and hiked the Appalachian Trail in five and a half months. She's a rock star. And Kwaku Hazel, who's uh, my surgeon from Ghana, who is getting trained to do these multi, uh, minimally invasive sur surgery tools here. And it's awesome. He walks through these <laughs> their surgical suites and he's like the mayor. And I'm just behind him, like hoping nobody yells at me. It's actually really fun. So thanks for your attention. Thanks for your time. Yeah, sorry. You're right yeah, now. so I have a couple questions. So kind of the first one I want to ask. Uh, so the work you showed is cells and genes. And I was wondering if you thought about doing any work in rodents. Is it like I'm not accessible in rodents? Like you've been trying to go through all these methods. Okay, so the question on Zoom is hey, dummy, why not use animals? <laughs> That's just yeah. distilling it down for you. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I've thought about that. Uh, but the problem is I like to work in people. We've cured rodent diabetes a number of times. It really hasn't been that helpful. So I want my work to be ultimately translatable. And so that's why I do human. Can, can I have a follow-up question? Because I was thinking at the moment, the same lines, almost as a proof of concept, have you thought about you or a colleague to, to develop a mouse model with IMAT deficiency? Oh, interesting. So what about an IMAT deficient mouse model? That's a cool that's idea. A, that's a proof of concept that do IMAT does participate in insulin resistance. I don't even know how we would do that. I don't. It's Phil Shearer's attack mouse that you can get rid of any adipose tissue you want to. Really? Oh, that's a cool idea. So get rid of IMAT. Well, it's a, not, it's not a fantastic easy. idea. And then see if these mice are protected or metabolic more healthy. It's a great idea. Yeah, I wonder if he could do that when we don't know the true ideology of IMAT. You have to have a unique uh, marker, right? You, it'd be a, a pre-cross in his But to make it, it would have to be tissue specific. So yeah. it would have to be uh, skeletal muscle specific, yeah. right? To, to... That's yeah. a cool question. I, it's something I hadn't thought of, but it's a great idea. Is there any unique molecule secreted by IMAT? So are there unique molecules secreted by IMAT? Um, I don't know. We have, so so we, we've done this as an approach to reviewers um, to try to figure out. Yeah, I know. It's all good. It's all good. Uh, is there a unique gene signature? Is there something unique about it by which we could say that, yes, this is definitely IMAT? We've waved our hands around to try to figure this out, but we haven't found like something that's truly unique. It, like all adipose tissue depots, it, it secretes a lot of the same stuff. It has a lot of the same negative cells that are part of the stromovascular fraction. Uh, it seems just to be different in terms of how much of it there. We haven't found anything unique yet, but it'd be great if we did. Yeah, the Have you noticed any differences in the uh, composition of fat within IMAP versus uh, subcutaneous with visceral adipose tissue? Because we saw that really high concentration of the uh, secretion of eicosanoids, uh, like that pro-inflammatory state. I would 
expect there to be more uh, like arachidonic acids or triglycerides within the tissue itself? Like, have you done any of those comparisons? Okay, so the question is, is the IMAT adipose tissue itself different than adipose tissue found in the subcutaneous or visceral compartments in terms of its composition? Right. Yeah, so we haven't looked at that. I think it's a cool idea. One of the things that I've really wanted to do is do immunohistochemistry to look at some of the other kind of mac macrophage and immune cell molecules to see if they're different between depots. But given that we need to do everything we can with what we have and we get really small IMAT samples, we haven't been able to do that. That also means, however, that we can't really do an analysis of the IMAT itself because that would mean taking this precious commodity and using it to do lipid content. Granted, the caveat to that is, okay, Bri, after you do this 24-hour exposure, why don't you do it then? Problem with that is we normalize all of our secret chunks of dry weight. So we need to have that entire amount of IMAT that we then can dry down. So because of limited tissue volume, I haven't been able to address that question, but it's a cool question. Yeah, because why, why are the subtitles higher? It's a great question. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Those are the hardest ones, so please. <laughs> That's the million dollar question. So the question here is, okay, why is I'm at there to begin with if it's such a bad thing? And I don't know, is the easy out. No idea. Um, could it be a buffer like cardiologists think about epicardial adipose tissue? Absolutely. Could it be this adipose tissue that is like everywhere else, it's only bad until it really accumulates and, and starts to have a lot more macrophages? I don't know. And that's something that we're going to try to address because we have some lean people that are coming in for these operations and we're going to be able to tell whether or not they have a fairly benign secretome profile because we're going to be able to compare these groups based on how we're recruiting them. So I guess my, my gut reaction would say I bet the more metabolically healthy you are, the, the IMAT isn't secreting as many of these negative factors. But as you gain weight and become you know, prediabetes and, and down the road to diabetes, I bet the secretome becomes more negative. But why is it there to begin with? It's kind of a question that haunts me. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you analyze the eye map between, for example, a feature or going a little bit more further, if you take a muscle biopsy of someone with a spinal cord injury and compare them with the same, for example, so how is the eye map in that person? That's an awesome question. So how does IMAT differ in people with a disease like, like yeah. spinal cord injury? Yeah. Or not. Disuse, disdains, muscular dystrophy, yeah. that kind of a thing? Yeah. Yeah, this is an important question, and I don't know what the answer is. So Lauren Sparks actually does a lot of work with Duchenne's muscular disease, and she has these kind of unique sample sets where she has like almost gram quantities of IMAT. And we haven't really used that in terms of RNA-seq analysis because the fear was it's not going to reflect garden variety IMAT and everybody else. This is also relevant for something my lab emailed me about yesterday because they recruited somebody for this study who's coming in for elective surgery who's paralyzed from the waist down. And I'm thinking, okay. Fascinating, right? Because that's a disuse, but it's also totally different than everybody else in the study. So I'm wrestling right now with whether to include this person. So we, we don't know. I'm imagining it's going to be quite different just because the, that amount of disuse, it's almost like veal, right? Yeah, so the MRI study shows there's two heads. Like, I don't, I don't know how much is I meant, but they still have quite a little blood fat in that tissue. I would imagine, yeah, they're still going to have a lot of fat in there, but how that relates to kind of people that are, are normally mobile, I don't know. Yeah. Would you include this person? I would do a case study. <laughs> case study, okay. Fine. <laughs> Expensive at the point. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> question. I think you kind of answered this when you were answering Mark's question. Um, like, I think that there's been a lot of literature that's shown that mitochondrial dysfunction. But I was kind of thinking, like, have you looked at mitochondria and IMAT, but you probably don't even have enough sample from what you have to then isolate mitochondria and then look at human quality and respiration, turnover, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. The question is, mitochondrial dysfunction and IMAT, is it a thing? Does it, because we know that it's, yeah, we have no idea because we're dealing with these minute, really small sample sizes. Uh, so could it be? Yeah. I have this pet idea that 
I want to look at the IMAT secret tome and see how it affects mitochondrial function and muscle, because I think that would be a really cool study. And is that a constant conversation that's going on that we're not aware of? It's possible. Yeah. So when, when you talk about IMAT as a therapeutic target, how do you envision targeting IMAT specifically and not other adipose tissue depots? All right. Okay. Uh, so I'm getting called out. So how are we going to target IMAT specifically and really target IMAT and not other adipose yeah, tissue depots? Once establish that IMAT causes insulin resistance, I completely agree with you. The next step is to, to have IMAT as a therapeutic target. But yeah. How are we going to... So how do we put on it? Yeah, so the way I'm thinking about it is from the secret tome. And we're actually, we have a, a relationship with Lily right now. And we uh, haven't just shown this data, but we have used the IMAT secret tome as a novel protein discovery platform. So we've done unbiased proteomics. I was telling somebody about this today. Unbiased proteomics on the IMAT secret tome. All right, so now you have this list of a thousand proteins that are secreted. We then relate those proteins. I'll get your answer. We related those proteins to donor insulin sensitivity, but that's not very gratifying because this is a huge list. And there could be proteins that are there just from the cell damage and stuff. So we've then taken that list and looked at proteins that have a signal peptide sequence. Proteins that are we know went down a uh, protein secretory pathway. So now it's getting interesting. Now you have IMAT secreted proteins that are related to donor insulin sensitivity. So we've taken these proteins, kind of looked at the ones that look like they might be interesting players, like not a red blood cell protein, that kind of thing. And we've purchased them. We've purchased recombinant protein and we've given them to muscle cells in a dose dependent way. And we found of the 10 we've tried so far, six of them actually caused insulin resistance in culture. So now things are getting interesting, right? So now we're trying to figure out, okay, how are these weird proteins acting? So we've done some reverse phase protein studies where we take these proteins, we put them on muscle cells, and they run what is effectively like a high throughput Western to show what pathways are being activated by these proteins. So we can try to antagonize them. So here's the answer to your question. So what we're hoping to find are unique proteins that are secreted that we can antagonize their action or antagonize the receptor or their protein on muscle. So we're not necessarily targeting the adipose tissue itself, but the end result on the muscle. Yep. So we're actually, we have a grand family of the Lily right now where we're gonna then try to start to uh, infuse and inject these proteins in animals, see if they cause insulin resistance, really go down the road to, to drug discovery, which is super exciting. And I don't know anything about it, but it's a fun road I'm excited to go down to try to figure out how can we antagonize the secret dome? And if anybody else has great ideas, please let me know because this is an important question. Yeah. This is a hard one to summarize. So, okay, so uh, the question is sex-based differences in IMAT and the IMAT secret tome. Have you studied it? How could you study it? Could you look at women pre-postmenopause or even people that are going through, uh, I don't even know what you call it, sex change operations? Yeah, that's a really cool question. Uh, we know there are sex-based differences in the RNA, uh, RNA expression profiles. It's on my like list of things to do. Look at the secret tome and see if there's different. I don't know if it's different. I would imagine that it is. And if it is, could some of that explain gender or sex-based differences in cardiovascular disease risk, diabetes risk? Is that what is lost post-menopause? Absolutely. These are cool questions. So come to a postdoc. <laughs> so yeah, I, I don't know. Is the answer. That's the easy answer. So just so that you guys know, nobody's doing this. So our lab is really the only one that is looking at IMAT and the secret tome. So what is known is what you just saw, literally. <laughs> there is no other data out there. And I love that ideas like this come in so we can kind of push the field forward. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I just had a quick question about like, last question. Yeah. So like, you know, in like the liver, like a 10% reduction in body fat can result in like a substantially higher reduction in liver fat. That one like weight loss study you did, did you see any sort of like you know a certain amount of reduction in body fat? Uh, reduction in like are they related? 
That's a cool question. So the question is, we know that small amounts of body weight can result in small amounts of changes in liver fat that actually has metabolic protection associated with it. Is there a similar thing that happens with IMAP? And it's a great question, and I don't know. And we're going to be able to look at that, though. Sorry, I don't know is the answer to everything, and I apologize. <laughs> so the, the weight loss study, where we did combined weight loss and exercise training, we weren't doing MRIs at the time, so I don't know. So the data that we do have, I can't relate to two. The data where I showed you the three groups, weight loss only, exercise training only, control, uh, that we do have MRIs for, and we're just now starting to analyze the secret film because we have these really, really small samples. We analyze them through an O-Link platform, which can give you 3,000 proteins from 10 microliters of, of volume, and it's really expensive. We try to match them all together. So I don't have the data to know if, is there like a certain amount of, it's a cool question, right? Is there a certain amount of weight loss that can actually promote metabolic, positive metabolic changes in the IMAT secret dome or even the IMAT content? And, and I don't know, I haven't related the change in body weight to the change in IMAT content, but that's a cool question. All right, we're gonna leave it here. Thank you. All right, thank you. <clears throat>